Chapter 36, Empty Heart On the first day of the second test of the Chunin exams, it was the first time in a while that a messenger bird with an urgent summons to the Hakage's council had tapped on the shoulder of every veteran jonin in the village. Heeding the call, the chamber was soon filled with clouds of smoke from multiple jonin body flickering in. One of the Chunin exam proctors had reported to the Hakage her shocking findings of a team of faceless corpses. The photo evidence was now presented to the jonin. While disturbed, most of them seemed blissfully ignorant of its implications. However, a select few immediately turned pale. The vanishing facial copy technique. But that can't be. Predictably, it was Anko who would boldly spit out the name of the culprit. Arachimaru. That snake is back. Yes, said the Hakage heavily. I, too, believe he has returned. It cannot be coincidence that this has happened in the midst of the Chunin exams when our village is filled with foreign ninja. Should we cancel the exams then? No. Arachimaru knows that this technique would give him away in an instant. And yet, he left those bodies out in plain view. He is challenging us, and losing our composure is not the right choice to make here. But Hakage-sama. That means our suspicions are true and that Akatsuki is involved. The Hakage's face turned grim. If only that was the least of it. We have reason to suspect that Orochimaru is connected to not just Akatsuki but other hidden villages. Perhaps even our allies. You think our allies would partner with Akatsuki and betray Konoha? Well, the treaties of alliance are really no more than verbal agreements. Kakashi interjected. It's just like the world wars of the past. In any case, right now we still have too little information. We must not make too many assumptions. The Konoha councilwoman added, we have already dispatched Anbu Black Ops to each nation to gather intelligence. It is imperative that we not make a single careless move. Our enemies will pounce on any such opportunity. The Hakage looked around at his agents. I have the utmost confidence in all of you. If it comes to it, we shall consolidate all of the Hidden Leaf's strength and fight. Haku, POV It was cold. Snow drifted down from the sky, covering the bridge in white and melting away where it touched his bare skin. A cold wind brushed against him. He shivered. But he had nowhere to go. The blood on his face had long since dried up and crusted over. He was all alone. The snow continued to drift by. Slowly, serenely. He wondered, if he closed his eyes, would the rest of the world disappear? Suddenly, a dark shadow fell on him, and he looked up. There was a tall man there. A ninja. Bandages covered most of his face, leaving just a pair of dark eyes. The man spoke in a low, brusque voice. Do you want to be needed by someone? Can you give everything to me? In a trance, he stood up. His eyes fixed on the face of the ninja before him. He felt his heart throb. He took a step and another. And then the man rested his hand on the top of his head. His eyes filled with tears. It had been too long since he last saw the man. He felt the man pull him to his side. But when the man spoke again, it was a hiss. Come find me when your own strength can take you no further. His heart dropping in his chest, he looked up. And instead of a bandaged face, he saw now the head of a snake, its maw open with wicked fangs bearing down on him. Haku! shouted a familiar voice. Ajisai? Everything was blurry. His head was spinning. One moment, a snake was about to tear into him, the next, his teammate was standing over him. But it was too painful to think. To be awake, Haku felt everything fade away into black. Hakage Office Unlike the Chunin promotion, which hinged on the evaluation of the host village conducting the Chunin exam, the Jonin promotion was by appointment of one's own Kage only. It was also a much more subdued ceremony. Naruto distinctly remembered the excessively elaborate sand structures from his own Chunin certification event. Do you swear your loyalty to the village of Kanahagakur and to the incumbent Hakage? Yes. Do you swear to protect the village and its people and to take its secrets to your grave? Yes. Then I appoint you, Yuzumaki Naruto, to the rank of Jonin, under allegiance to the village of Kanahagakur. Henceforth, you will respond solely to me, for as long as I hold the title of Hakage. Yes, Hakage-sama. Eyes beaming out from below his hat, the Hakage regarded Naruto proudly. You've done well. Minato and Kashina would have been proud of you. As would have your old teammates. Thank you. It is customary that a Jonin go on his first mission solo. That being said. The Hakage's smile faded. I have a pertinent update for you, Naruto. I have received information that all but confirms that the Akatsuki have started to make a move against a hidden leaf. Akatsuki. The mercenary group that was hunting down Jinchuriki. 
he'd encountered two of their members in Wave Country, even with the power of the Nine Tails, he'd barely managed to kill one of them. And now, it seemed they were bearing down on Fire Country. Perhaps sensing Naruto's unspoken questions, the Hakage continued. I have decided not to cancel the Chunin exams. However, in order to gather more information, I have sent out many operatives. And this concerns my urgent mission for you. You will escort a medic nin to aid a wounded undercover agent in Earth Country who may be in possession of vital information and bring both of them back to our village before the start of the third exam. This is a mission of air rank difficulty. Discretion is the rule. The Iwa nin must never find out that we have been spying on them. You think the Akatsuki won't attack before the third exam? It is unlikely. They will be waiting for when the foreign delegations have all arrived. That is, when we are at our most vulnerable. Naruto paused. While his next question was impertinent for his position, he figured they had been sidestepping the issue for long enough. Did your council have you request this mission of me? For a long moment, the Hakage mulled over the question on his pipe. And then he sighed. No. They did not. Given your Jinchuriki status, they would prefer to keep you close by. And I feel the same way, Naruto. You must consider me a puppet, dancing to the tune of my advisors, and by extension, the village. Perhaps over the years, that has become the case. The Hakage spread out his hands. However, putting all that aside, Naruto, you are not just a Jinchuriki. You are a Jonin now. With qualifications that make you suitable for this mission. That being the case, will you accept it? The Hakage's face had been lined with wrinkles for as long as Naruto could remember. When he was a child, the Hakage had always seemed ancient, a legendary piece of history. In a phrase, the god of shinobi, as some called him. As Naruto had grown older, the Hakage had become a leader behind a mask. Someone with ulterior motives, someone whose true face he couldn't see. Yes, Hakage-sama, replied Naruto. An unreadable emotion flickered in the Hakage's eyes. Thank you. Naruto. As always, the small, cynical voice in Naruto told him that this show of vulnerability was yet another tool at the Hakage's disposal to bend him to his will. But in that instant, he thought he'd caught a glimpse of the face behind the mask. Later. With the sudden change in plans, it was decided that Naruto would leave for the mission at sunset. Time was sensitive, and although getting to Earth Country on his own wouldn't have been an issue, he would have to deal with not just a medic nin, but possibly an injured operative. All the while avoiding detection from Iwa Nin. Certainly, a challenging mission for a Jonin barely five minutes into his initiation. Still, what with Kakashi busy these days training his Junin team and Jiraiya having disappeared on his own business, Naruto thought it would make a nice change in pace from skulking around the village. There wasn't anything Naruto needed to pack for the mission, over his years of travel with Jiraiya, he had learned to become self-sufficient and knew how to obtain food and shelter, no matter where he went. Still, just in case. When Naruto left his apartment, his clone stared back at him just before he closed the door. As he headed to the gates, where he'd been told the medic nin would be waiting for him, he looked up at the stone faces of the Hakage monument that bore down on the village. Several people had told Naruto that he greatly resembled his father, the fourth Hakage. It was part of the reason why he kept his hair cropped short. He had never known his father, and if he wanted to endure the world around him, he had to live his life in the present, not the past. And yet, he couldn't help but think. Now what? He had once wanted to become strong enough to protect those he cared about. But after Ryan Mayu had died, there was something he had realized, though he hadn't been able to put it into words at the time. No matter how strong you were, when it mattered the most, all of that power couldn't save anyone. Because in the end, everyone was alone. Naruto wasn't the only one who had lost his team. Kakashi had as well. The same could be said for Jiraiya, the Hakage. The most powerful people he knew hadn't been able to save the ones they'd wanted to protect. With all his years of experience, Kakashi had said that all they could do was to endure. That was what being a ninja meant. However, Naruto had thought there was more to it than that. That there had to be more than that. So he had traveled the world in search of all the things that he couldn't understand. But rather than finding answers, he had only found more questions. Until now, each step of his way had been obvious to him. It had been easy to move forward when he could clearly see where it would take him. But now, the way ahead was dark. Though he kept stepping forward, he no longer knew where it was that he was heading. Hinata POV Yuga Hinata? At the sound of the unfamiliar voice, Hinata immediately answered, Ah. Yes. She turned around. And felt her lips part in surprise. Him, of all people. While Hinata had known that a Jonin would be escorting her on her mission, 
she certainly hadn't expected the village's pariah to be the one to approach her. I'm Naruto, said the young man. As though there was anyone in the village who didn't know of him. Not to mention, they'd once been in the same academy class when they were younger. Are you ready to leave? Swallowing, Hinata nodded. Yes. Unceremoniously, they lined up at the exit gate, and soon, Hinata found herself trailing the Jonin along a well-trodden path. He didn't seem the talkative type, nor did she really want to hold a conversation with him. She didn't remember much of him from the short time they'd been in the same academy class, but she'd heard the stories about him from the other Chunin. While they acknowledged his skill, they all knew he wasn't someone you got involved with. There was also, of course, the one blemish on his otherwise spotless track record. The disaster of the wave incident from three years past. Both of Naruto's teammates had been killed in action, and though the specific details of the mission had never been released, after Naruto disappeared from the village, the majority opinion held that it had been his fault. And now he was mysteriously back. And Hinata was alone with him. Naruto had been examining the map, but suddenly, he turned towards her. You're a Chunin, right? Yes, said Hinata. Starting to feel somewhat self-conscious of her repetitive replies, she added, only medical ninja who have received a Chunin certification are allowed to go on missions above sea rank. I see. With that, Naruto put away his map and began to pick up his speed. It was apparent that he knew nothing about her. However, despite the fact that this was technically an escort mission, he obviously expected Hinata to carry her own weight. Somehow, that brought a small smile to her lips. It made a welcome change to be thought of in that way. Meantime in Leaf Village In the crowds of Leaf Nin and foreign ninja alike streaming in and out of the village, nobody noticed the two Suna Nin speaking quietly to one another. Everything is in place, said Baki. I will return to Wind Country now to report to the Lord Fourth. Make sure to keep Gara under control, Tamari. Tamari hid her frown, her given task was far easier said than done, but it was her duty, and she would see it through. It was the least she could do while her countrymen prepared for the inevitable war that rapidly approached. Yes Baki. Safe travels. While she may have been the daughter of the Kazukage, she was currently no more than a glorified babysitter for Gara. Nonetheless, they would play a critical role in their scheme against a hidden leaf, and if all went well, she would become a part of her father's inner circle. Of course, that was a big if. Even Tamari, who only had a shadow of an idea of what was going to happen in the third exam, knew that the scale of their mission was nothing like they'd ever attempted before. The annihilation of a powerful hidden village, one of the major powers of their era. Once the dust had settled, what would the resulting world look like? By the time Tamari returned to their quarters, the sun had set and the moon was a crescent in the sky. There was a dark figure standing outside the building, Tamari froze, as she realized Gara was waiting outside for her. However, a hurried glance at his face told her that. Perhaps with the decreasing influence of the waning moon he seemed to be in more control of himself. Slowly, she let out a breath that she hadn't realized she'd been holding. Where were you? Was his cold greeting. I was seeing Baki off. Did you eat dinner? Gara didn't respond, instead looking sullenly away. Meaning Tamari would have to figure out dinner for the two of them. For the two of them. Not for the first time that week, a haze settled over her. For all her flippancies, Mitsuri, their teammate, had been a good cook. Tamari would miss her miso soup, in particular. With a heavy heart, she wondered how Baki would explain Mitsuri's death to her family. Would it be killed in action like last time? Of course, everyone would instantaneously guess at what had truly come to pass. These days, with so many families having lost someone to Gara, Tamari found even herself. Purely by association. Being subjected to the villagers' hate-filled gazes. It hurt when she had worked so hard and sacrificed so much for the sake of their people, but she couldn't blame them. A cloud must have covered the moon, as for a moment, everything was dark. Then the moment passed, and the glow of moonlight shone down on them. I think I saw a ramen spot around here, said Tamari, forcing herself to smile. How does that sound to you? Hinata, POV as expected of a Hyuga, the medic nin with pale eyes seemed to have no trouble keeping up with Naruto's steady pace through the wilderness of fire country. What was more surprising to Naruto was that a member of the main house of the Hyuga clan would have deigned to join the medical field at all. While an extremely difficult and accomplished field, the main impression that he'd gotten from his limited interactions with their branch members was that they were far too proud to play a mere supporting role. They had reached the border of grass country before the day was done, and in that time, they must have exchanged only a handful of sentences between them. He could feel the waves of curiosity coming off of her, though whether out of politeness or apprehension, she didn't voice any questions. 
On his end, Naruto refrained from commenting on Hinata's lineage. He'd butted heads with her clansman Neji enough as it was, ever since they'd first had the misfortune to meet in their Chunin exams. It wasn't until they were well into Earth territory that they finally ran into some trouble. Though Naruto had spent a non-insignificant amount of time in the country while traveling with Jiraiya, they had usually journeyed undercover as civilians and went out of their way to avoid clashing with the foreign power. If you ever get into a fight with someone from Earth country, Jiraiya would say, you'd better plan on either losing the fight or killing them outright. Stubbornest people I've ever met, and I knew your mother. Ha, huh? you trying to pick a fight? Said the short, weasel-looking man blocking their way across the bridge. It's simple. You want to cross, you pay the toll. But it doesn't say anywhere that we have to pay a toll here, protested Hinata. The man gave her the stink eye. You two don't look like you're from around here. What would you know about how we run things? Pay the passage of 300 Ryo, or I'll call the police on you, and you definitely don't want that. Naruto knew for a fact that this was a bluff, the official police force of Iwagakur didn't bother patrolling this far from the hidden village. Even if there was a local police body around this area, it was most likely a hodgepodge group of volunteers who were at best academy level. Still, as tempting as it was, he couldn't simply overpower him. While it was unlikely any passing Iwanin would pay attention to his blabbering, there was a much easier way to settle this matter. Naruto quickly assessed the situation. One of his clones that he'd sent out to check their surroundings was in the vicinity, and another passing traveler was approaching the bridge making the setup complete. He pointed. Aren't you going to charge that person too? The weasel-like man turned around and saw to his surprise a bald man about to step across the bridge. Wait, stop right there. But. First, you too. One hand forming the ram seal behind his back, Naruto's other hand opened to reveal three gold coins that he wordlessly handed over. In a flash, the coins disappeared, and the man's menacing glare turned into a white beaming smile. Have a good day. With a quick welcoming sweep towards the bridge, he scurried away towards his next bewildered victim. The golden coins rattled ominously in the man's breast pocket. Karen POV He's gone. Opening her eyes, Karen dropped to the ground. Somehow, in the short period of time while she'd been training her taijutsu, Naruto had managed to leave the village in her range. A mission? But for how long would he be gone? Suddenly, a spinning blob shot out at her. Gritting her teeth, Karen blocked the brunt of the blow with her arms, but the force still sent her reeling backwards. The blob came to a quick stop, revealing a large man with a shaved head. Her teammate. Panting, Karen felt blood drip from her nose. Yurami. She heard Kazami admonish. I told you to hold back a little. That's what she gets for zoning out, Yurami sneered. You've been acting uppity ever since you made the finals, Karen. But don't forget that in the end, you're only good for your chakra. Karen bristled, but as usual, her throat constricted, and she didn't say anything back. She knew she'd only regret it when they returned to grass country. Clink, clink. More and more these days, it felt like her whole body was being restrained by chains. Chains that tied her to the hidden grass, to Zasui. And to herself. She hadn't felt this way, back when her mother had been alive, and sometimes, she wondered whether her mother had felt so trapped in her final moments. Karen dared not hope. And yet she couldn't help but wonder whether this chakra power of hers, the only thing that she was good for. Would Naruto find it useful as well? Hinata POV Hinata looked down at her map and then up at the narrow cave opening. She wouldn't have even noticed it if Naruto had not pointed it out to her. This cave isn't on the map, she said hesitantly. It says that if we go around the base of the mountain, we'll eventually find a hidden stairwell. Naruto shook his head. That'll add another half day to the journey. I've been here before. This is the fastest way through. Okay. But just to confirm. Concentrating her chakra to her eyes, Hinata activated her Keke Genkai. By Akugan. The secrets of her surroundings were unveiled to her, and she realized that he was right. The cave quickly widened out to a large man-made tunnel that traversed the mountain and emerged near their destination. As they made their way through the dark tunnel, Hinata deactivated her eyes and instantly lost all visibility. However, the way was straightforward enough, and there were no other nearby chakra signatures. Even if there had been, she doubted she would have noticed, what with Naruto's strange chakra following her. Her Byakugan allowed her to trace the chakra circulatory system of any individual within her range. Everyone, even civilians, had such a system. The main difference came from whether they were able to control their chakra flow and their innate chakra reserves. But it looked as though Naruto had two sources of chakra. In a flash, it struck Hinata. 
did it have something to do with the reason why everyone thought he was a monster? Suddenly, she realized she could see the vague outline of the walls around them, the tunnel was growing lighter. They were still only halfway through, so it couldn't be sunlight. They soon emerged into a small cavern filled with a glowing pale light. Hinata walked over to the walls and to her amazement, realized they were covered in some kind of spongy moss that emitted the light. Hinata turned back to report her findings to Naruto, but saw that he was already looking up at the luminous ceiling, with a strange expression on his face. If she had to put it in a word, it was wistful, and it was the most emotion she'd seen from him since they'd left the village. What was he thinking about? I'm sorry I doubted you, she said at last. Without looking at her, Naruto replied, you should always confirm things with your own eyes. Even more so for someone like you. But sometimes, even my Byakugan doesn't tell me the entire truth, Hinata said softly. Naruto lowered his gaze, and she saw that his face was blank again. Let's keep moving. Kakashi POV The roar of a summoned beast echoed through the forest, followed shortly by the deep rumbling of the ground splitting apart. Soon afterwards, the sound of a thousand chirping birds swelled out from the trees, accompanied by sparks of lightning. From Kakashi's vantage point, he could get a general gist of the ongoing battle, and given the battering he'd undergone at the hands of his former student, he was rather glad he was all the way up here in the tree, instead of down on the forest floor. Furthermore, what with training his team, he didn't feel like he was simply twiddling his thumbs, waiting for the inevitable attack on their village. The group of missing nin calling themselves Akatsuki, the Jinchuriki, the presence of their allied villages in the Chunin exams. Even though they knew there was something tying all of these together, it seemed they could do nothing until their mysterious enemy first made a move. The tense shroud that enveloped the hidden leaf these days was not unlike what had covered the village 15 years ago, when the Nine Tails had attacked. While Kakashi had been too young to be allowed in the village's main line of defense, this time around, he was more than prepared to put his life down on the line. He'd be damned if he lost anyone else without a fight. Hinata POV they hadn't been fast enough. Or perhaps, it had been a hopeless mission from the start. They'd found the leaf agent they had been sent out to rescue lying on the floor of the designated safe house in a puddle of congealed blood. His eyes were wide open, staring blankly up at the ceiling. A leg and an arm had been amputated. Both in a single, powerful blow, by the looks of the cleanly sliced flesh. The nearest window had a missing curtain, allowing a stray ray of sunlight into the otherwise darkened room, it seemed the dying ninja had used it in an attempt at a tourniquet. Naruto watched as Hinata knelt by the body and checked for a pulse. However, it was a futile endeavor, and after a moment, she looked up at Naruto and shook her head. He's been dead at least half a day. It looks like he lost too much blood and went into shock. There was something missing here. The Hakage would not have spared a medic nin and a jonin on a futile mission. The perpetrator wasn't able to finish him off. If he had time to try and patch himself up, he should have had time to leave a message. Naruto searched the corpse however, nothing turned up. The only thing that seemed to be there was a cold, stiffening body. To his surprise, Hinata spoke up. Allow me, if you will. The muscles around her pale eyes grew pronounced as she activated her by Akigen. She scanned the corpse, before coming to a sudden stop at his stomach. There's something there. A message. He must have swallowed it. His stomach acids have already started to digest it, but let me see. She paused. Akatsuki is making a weapon. To control. The world. The Leafs. Jinchuriki. Is their last target. Her ominous words rang in the resultant silence. A weapon? Naruto looked down at the corpse's still face. The ninja who had died for this one message. There was an old scar running down the side of his face, Naruto couldn't remember seeing anyone with his features at the village. But then again, he'd never paid too much attention to others outside his immediate circle of acquaintances. Reaching over, Naruto closed the man's eyes shut. We have to inform the Lord Third as soon as possible, said Hinata. Getting up, Naruto nodded. That much was obvious. The question was, would they make it back in time? At a hard pace's traveling, they had reached their location after three days. But now, the sun was already setting on the day, and the third exam would be starting early in the morning. Should he send a clone back? No. While shadow clones were hardier than your average clone, they were still vulnerable to too many attacks for them to serve use offensively against any opponent worth their salt. Then, should he leave behind the medic Nin and speed back to the Hidden Leaf on his own? Not only would he be abandoning his duty of escorting her, it would drain him to cover that much distance using his lightning chakra. But if he summoned Amakuro, suddenly, Naruto's head spun as a deluge of memories rushed into his mind. One of his shadow clones had been taken out. 
more specifically, the one he'd transformed into a coin and left with the weasel-faced crook. He'd planned on letting it linger there as a safety measure and as a potential spying mechanism. But now, it seemed, the man he'd left it with was dead. Give you money? Said an unknown male voice. It was dark in the pocket, but the clone could still hear everything happening around him. The male voice spoke politely, and yet something about it told him its owner was not someone to be trifled with. Unfortunately, the weasel blocking the bridge must have had a rather successful day, taking advantage of passing travelers, and let it get to his head. That's right. And if you don't pay up, I'll have the police go after you. Today's not your lucky day, said the voice. If I wasn't alone, you might have lived. What are you talking about, you shark-faced bastard? Abruptly, the memory stopped there. Presumably, a single blow had taken out his clone as well. Naruto blinked again. No matter how many times it happened, it always managed to disorient him. Naruto, said Hinata. Right now, I'm just dead weight. But I can take care of myself. Please? Go back ahead of me and inform the Hakage of our discovery. Naruto stopped. Her too, he thought. What gave her the strength to be left behind? What had given the undercover agent the loyalty to die for this one message? What inspired Jiraiya to write books? What pushed Kakashi to train his students? They must have all had their own reasons. An answer to something that they valued above their own lives, an answer that drove them. The question was, what did Naruto have driving him? Was it the desire to be respected by the villagers? He had forsaken that dream ages ago. To gain the strength to protect those he cared about, he had already failed. To avenge the deaths of his teammates, there was nothing left to gain from their vengeance. To cling to life. To survive? No, he realized. He had nothing. There was nothing at all. Hinata POV During the past several days they had spent together, Hinata had not shared with Naruto her life story. He couldn't possibly know that her father had disinherited her years ago for failing to hurt her younger sister, or that she had ranked rock bottom at the Chunin exams and become a laughingstock in her clan. Naruto didn't know that for someone like her, who had been drowning in a world of senseless violence, medical ninjutsu had become her lifeline. He couldn't have known. He was a prodigy, after all. A natural in ninjutsu and the art of assassination. But she knew that he must have had more than his fair share of troubles. And what she had sensed in their short time together was that he was not quite the monster others had made him out to be. No, said Naruto. He held out a hand towards her, and suddenly, to her shock, lightning chakra began flickering around his form. I won't leave you behind. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 Burial This feeling. What was this feeling, coursing through him? His thoughts, usually so sharp and focused, felt like they were in a jumble. One thought led to another, before falling short, and then scrambling to another, before repeating, like waves on a shore. When he opened his mouth, however, what somehow came out was, no, I won't leave you behind. Lightning began to course seamlessly through Naruto's body, his hair standing on end. Hinata looked taken aback, her pale eyes whitening with surprise. Are you sure? Don't worry. You won't be electrocuted. To prove his point, Naruto encased his hands in a top layer of wind chakra. No, it's not that. Won't I slow you down? We're surrounded by enemy ninja here. I can't leave you behind. Somehow, his mouth was moving automatically, forming the words he needed. If it makes you feel any better, you're a medic nin. If the village is in any danger, we'll need every medic we have. A beat passed, as Hinata considered it. And then she nodded. Her features tightening with purpose, she unfurled a scroll. In a flash of smoke, the undercover agent's corpse and its accompanying bodily fluids disappeared, leaving behind no evidence that anything had ever been there. She was an excellent ninja, Naruto thought. And loyal. She was willing to compromise her own safety in exchange for the village's protection. It was strange to think that he had once been like her. Naruto? Are you ready? Refocusing himself, Naruto summoned two shadow clones. He didn't need to give any commands, with a nod at their originator, they simultaneously formed a tiger seal with their hands before flickering away. Their job would be to gather natural energy for him, the journey back to the hidden leaf would be taxing, and he needed every resource he could get. Turning back to Hinata, Naruto extended his wind chakra to the rest of his arms and his chest. This is going to be a little uncomfortable, but hang on tight. In a forest cave not too far from the hidden leaf, a group of sound nin chittered in the darkness. By some stint of their village's ninjutsu, their voices traveled no further than the entrance to the cave, assuring that their relentless advance towards their goal remained undetected. Man, I'm itching for some action already. 
it won't be long now. Just a few more hours. Those leaf bastards won't know what hit them. Brave words. But Toby could smell the stink of fear coming off of them. While the hidden leaf was not as formidable as the hidden cloud, you couldn't expect to partake in an invasion against one of the great hidden villages and walk away unscatched. What are you snickering about? It seemed one of them had noticed Toby sitting alone in the corner. Snickering? What gave you that impression? With an unflattering yelp, Toby hunched over. I think that fish I had earlier was bad. My stomach hurts. Bleerg. Hurriedly, the others backed away and returned to their mutterings. Dropping back down to the ground, Toby leaned his masked face against his fist and regarded the silhouettes spread out in the cave. It was very likely that not a single one of them would survive the coming battle. Fear not, he thought. Their sacrifices would not be meaningless. Naruto, POV The sun had just broken across the horizon when they crossed into fire country. The increasingly familiar scenery around them passed in a blur as Naruto blitzed through the trees, pale lightning crackling in his wake. The journey so far hadn't been as draining as Naruto had feared. Hinata was lighter than she looked, feeling nearly weightless in his arms. Or perhaps he was just that distracted. All of a sudden, without warning, a dark shadow tumbled down from the sky. Flailing limbs, the rustle of a cloak. It was the body of a dead man, and right as it passed Naruto, he saw its dark eyes, staring accusingly back at him. A jolt running down his spine, Naruto almost skidded to a stop. But he kept going. And then one by one, more appeared. Ghostly figures in ragged cloaks, falling down from the sky around him like leaves in the wind. It was nonsensical, it wasn't real. However, while it almost felt like the times when Amakuro had played an illusionary trick on him, he knew that it wasn't again Jutsu. No, it was a memory, distorted, drawn up from the recesses of his mind. He hadn't thought of them in a very long time. His first kills. It had happened on his first mission involving bodyguard duty. He and his team had been escorting a silk merchant's caravan to Yugakur when bandits had attacked. Naruto had ended up killing all of them, even the one that had begged for his life. At the time, he had thought that was the only way to carry out his mission. He had steeled his heart and committed himself to his cause. And yet, following that, when the missing Nin Haiden had attacked Yugakur, he had thrown himself in front of a civilian boy during the middle of the fight. Naruto hadn't been able to explain it at the time, other than feeling a need to save the boy. As they fell, the ghostly bandits looked at him, their necks gleaming red and their dark eyes searing into his back as he swiftly passed them. Was it the same impulsive need driving Naruto right now, despite everything that had happened since then? The people he had encountered, the training and journeys he had undergone. Had nothing about him changed at all? Meantime in Leaf Village The throng of bodies milling about the stadium was a security detail's nightmare. As civilians and senior shinobi alike crowded through the gates, any attempt to herd the masses in an orderly fashion had long since dissipated. Rather, any effort to exert control would have been superfluous, for numerous members of the Leafs elite were scattered throughout the audience, their presence revealed not so subtly by their painted masks. After the village's prolonged hiatus from acting as host for the Chunin exams, it was a blatant show of power, an audacious greeting to quash any possible thoughts of betrayal from their so-called allies. The participating nation's Kage overlooked the stage from the lofty apex of the stands, their shadowy figures distinguished only by the color of their hats. After an outwardly pleasant exchange of small talk, the three had fallen silent, no doubt, the real discussions would have to wait until they were behind closed doors. The third exam was about to begin. In one of the tunnels connecting the stadium to the outside, two shinobi walked side by side in seemingly companionable conversation. The hit I ate on their persons signified their allegiance to the hidden rain, their privacy was secured by the watchful presence of two others from their village. What? Ajisai couldn't believe her ears. The jonin was still talking, but while his lips continued to move, Ajisai couldn't comprehend a single syllable. She couldn't have heard him correctly. And yet there was no other way to interpret his words. After the Chunin exams are over, Haku is to be given over to the hidden sound. The Jonin had already moved on to another topic, namely that of the next set of orders from the Lady Angel. It was unfathomable for Ajisai to even dream of interrupting, when she clung onto every mention of their savior, and yet, this, this, she could not let pass. Wait, I'm sorry, she broken. What do you mean he's to be given over? The Jonin eyed her darkly, clearly irritated at being cut off. What are you even talking about? She stopped, her heart beginning to sink. Haku. What do you mean give him over to the hidden sound? What about that seal on him I mentioned in the report? Oh, him, yes, we're aware of it. 
We've made a deal with the Hidden Sound to give him to them in exchange for their cooperation. The Jonin paused, taking in her expression. He's not even from our village, you know. This this is coming from Tenchi-sama? Ajisai sputtered. The Jonin raised an eyebrow. Are you questioning her word? Ajisai shrunk back, her mind spinning at the thought of such blasphemy. Of course not. Never. I just. Be grateful you were even given the honor of being a part of this plan. Now, do you understand your next orders? Ah uh, yes. Yes sir. Do not fail us. The lady's salvation is almost at hand. And with that last warning, the Jonin left, disappearing with the other two aim nin. Her heart thudding in her chest, Ajisai looked out at the audience still streaming into the stadium. Somewhere below the stadium, she knew that Haku was waiting for his upcoming fight. The seal shouldn't have been affecting him physically, and yet, he had been barely able to get out of the hospital bed that morning. Oh, Surin, Ajisai quietly called out her fallen teammate's name. How could she have let things turn out this way? As team leader, she had utterly failed. Naruto, POV The sun climbed higher in the sky as they drew closer to the hidden leaf, and Naruto could feel the burn of chakra exhaustion inching upon him. Though the ghostly bandits had faded with the distance, as the sun's rays trickled down through the canopy, Naruto saw three new figures regarding him. They, too, were drawn from his memories, and they spoke words they had never said aloud to him. You actually thought I considered you one of my shinobi? Said the Hakage, his lined features twisting amusedly. You fool. I was simply using you. Jiraiya shook his head irritably. You're nothing at all like your father. Are you really his son? They should have given me my new team to start with, said Kakashi, looking away. Swallowing, Naruto picked up his speed, and with a crackling sound, burst through the jeering phantoms. As he did so, his whole body felt cold, and yet, he could feel a bead of sweat trickle down his brow. This was no time for this, he thought to himself. The village was going to be attacked. He needed to regain control over himself. Suddenly, from the corner of his eye, he caught a flash of blue. Wings outstretched, a bird flitted by. Leaf Village The quarterfinals flew by in a series of increasing mismatches, as the foreign ninja overwhelmed their leaf opponents with ease. Gradually, the riotous crowd, predominantly made up of leaf shinobi and civilians, that had started the day quieted down to a disappointed buzz. The last quarterfinal bracket was a match between the female Sunagenon, Tamari, and the Leafs' final chance at redemption. Yamanaka Ino. This is going to be unfortunate, Sakura thought to herself with no small amount of glee. True to expectation, it appeared Tamari had been paying attention during the preliminaries. As soon as the match began, she kept her distance, remaining constantly in motion while distracting Ino with her wind jutsu. Come on, cousin. Menma shouted, cupping his hands around his mouth to magnify his already loud voice. Beat that crusty sand bitch. Menma. Sakura hissed, dragging his hands away. Shrugging her off, Menma scowled. What's the big deal? Everyone else is doing it. Would you jump off a cliff if everyone else was doing it? Well, it wouldn't be my first time, he stubbornly maintained. A loud groan sounded from the audience around them. The two returned their attentions to the stage, only to see Ino's prone figure lying face down. Tamari landed on the ground and folded up her giant fan. The proctor, Shikamaru, raised a hand. The winner is Tamari from the hidden sand. Naruto, POV There were two shadows leaping beside Naruto. He knew he shouldn't have paid any attention to them, he should have gone straight past them. But despite himself, he turned to look at their faces, and at the familiar sight, he felt a lump rising in the back of his throat. I always knew you were a monster, whispered the girl, fearfully. You're not real, Naruto replied instantly, his heart thundering in his chest. It's not fair, the boy spat, his scarred features twisting in disgust. You don't care about anyone besides yourself. So why are you the one who survived? You're not really Naruto, said the girl, her voice growing louder. The real Naruto disappeared a long time ago. You're just an empty vessel trying to pass as a human when really you're the Nine Tails. That's not true. Naruto? came a voice from below. Are you okay? At the sound, the two shadowy figures faded away, and Naruto shook his head in a daze. When he had stopped, he saw a pair of concerned, pale eyes gazing up at him. He wondered if she could feel his pounding heartbeat. We're almost there, he said quietly. Leaf Village Footsteps echoed in the dark tunnel where Gara had been waiting his turn. He opened his eyes and saw his sister's face, pale and drawn. Remember, Gara. At the signal. Uncrossing his arms, he straightened up, and without a word, he brushed past his sister. 
As soon as Gara had crossed into the open, sunlight struck his face, harsh and unforgiving, momentarily blinding him. Then, as the white spots faded from his vision, he found himself standing across from a girl with hair that burned like fire in the daylight. Moving on to the semifinals will be Karen from the hidden grass versus Gara from the hidden sand, cried the proctor. He fixed Gara with a sharp look before snapping his hand up into the air. Begin. The girl didn't waste any time, bursting into action with a quick series of hand seals that sent her plunging bodily into the ground. The audience began to murmur uneasily, no doubt waiting for Gara to retaliate. He didn't move from his position, though he couldn't track her as well as he could have in the desert, there was no attack his sand couldn't protect him from. All he had to do was wait, and his prey would come to him on its own. Sure enough, before long, the ground at Gara's feet suddenly exploded. A paper bomb planted below him, perhaps. It made no difference, as the sand that immediately rose up around him as a shield absorbed the heat of the sudden explosion. His arms still crossed across his chest, Gara moved only the pupils of his eyes as he looked around for the girl. However, it seemed she had not revealed herself with the attack, choosing to bite her time underground. A wise decision, staying out of sight, he wasn't interested in fighting her. And if it had been anyone else besides him, perhaps it would have extended her life for just a few extra minutes. But time was of the essence, and it was running out. Both for her and for himself. Mother is growing restless. Gara watched as his chakra-infused sand began to trickle back to his gourd. The smell of old blood wafted into his face, and his nostrils flared. From the corner of his eye, he caught a sudden burst of movement from the audience. And then a dark shadow unfolded itself over Gara. Tamari stood on the rim of the stadium, her giant fan raised into the sky and blocking the sun. It was the signal they'd agreed upon. Without hesitation, Gara formed the ram seal. Feigning sleep technique. For the first time in a long while, the sweet and terrifying bliss of sleep descended forcefully upon him. He could feel mother roaring in delight, rising out of him. His eyes fluttered shut, and his last fleeting thought was a question, when he awoke. If he awoke, would the world have come to an end? Deep underground, the moment Gara fell asleep, Karen sensed the shift in chakra, though she hadn't yet realized its ramifications. For a split second, the overbearing feral and bloodthirsty chakra seemed to recede, and Karen sensed the chakra lying underneath. It was cold, it was furious. But it was also tired and lonely, and in a way, it reminded her of Naruto's chakra. Then, it exploded. Pure, unadulterated hatred and wrath. Words couldn't describe the churning mammoth of chakra exploding above the ground. Immediately, Karen opened her eyes, but she could still feel the chakra. Her limbs went cold, and tears streamed down her cheeks. The sheer malevolence was so overwhelming, she found herself frozen. But the earth around her shook with a rumble, and Karen knew that if she didn't move, she would be buried alive. Give me strength, she prayed to the stars. Making a snake seal with her hands, Karen burrowed as far back as she could, molding apart the earth with her chakra, before shooting above ground. When she emerged, she found herself just outside of the stadium, and what met her was chaos. The first thing she noticed was the giant monster with seal markings all over its body crouched inside the stadium. It had a horrifically jagged maw, and there was a strange roaring sound coming from it. And Karen realized, her stomach flip-flopping, that it was laughing. It had a single tail which came crashing down with an explosive sound, tearing through half of the entire stadium. A cloud of thick dust swept through the air, and giant slabs of shattered rock crashed into the ground. With that single sound, the world became unmuted, and Karen realized people were screaming. The civilians who had survived were struggling to escape the stadium, but there were ninja. Foreign ninja. Suddenly descending upon the chaos, and they slaughtered anyone in their paths. The leaf nin, after an initial scramble to overcome their shock, seemed to have rallied together. They must have somehow been prepared for the possibility of such an onslaught, as Karen watched, several masked Anbu ripped through a mixed gang of Suna and Aim Nin, body parts and blood splattering the broken concrete. Karen. To her horror, a bloody figure was dragging himself to her. His stomach had been cut open, and he was struggling to contain his slippery guts from spilling out. While it was difficult to make out his features through the blood and dirt coating his face, the body could only belong to one person. Yurami, her teammate. Karen. Your arm. He howled, tears and mucus streaming down his face. Heal me. Desperately, he reached out for her. Automatically, Karen started to offer her arm. And then she stopped. Why? Why did she need to heal him when Zasui wasn't here? When nobody was watching her? When she hated him? She took a step back, her heart pounding so hard she thought it would burst in her chest. No, Karen said, relishing the taste of the word in her mouth.
Jurya POV. The freed one tails beast roared, and enemy ninja rained down from the sky, landing in their village. The ground shook with every step the beast took, and a wall of purple flames flickered on the rooftop, isolating the Hakage and Kazakage. Before Jureya could cry out a warning, one of the Anbu threw themselves at the wall and let out a scream as they immediately burst into flames. It was a near-impenetrable barrier jutsu, erected into place by four sound shinobi. And that could only mean one thing. Visible through the wall of flames, before the Kazakage even dug his fingers into his face to rip it away, Jureya already knew. Arachimaru, he said soberly, looking into the waxen face of his old teammate. After all these years, it seemed he had finally returned to the hidden leaf, to kill their teacher and destroy the village as he had once promised. Jureya had known this day would come, and still, he felt his heartache. It was his fault he had let it come to this. He hadn't been able to bring himself to hunt Arachimaru down and kill him, as he should have. Raising his hands, he prepared himself to break through the barrier, even if it cost him his life. When suddenly, a hulking figure landed with a crash beside him. It was the bodyguard that had been accompanying the fake Kazakage. Before Jureya's eyes, he burst apart in an array of flying limbs, and he realized it had been a puppet. There was someone else hidden within, controlling its every movement. He was dark and hunched over, and wore the black robes of what Jureya now immediately recognized as a sign of his affiliation with the criminal organization Akatsuki. Your opponent is me, growled the man. Naruto, POV. Plumes of smoke rose in the distance, clouding the sky. There could only be one explanation, and it was what the Hakage had foreseen and yet failed to prevent. An attack on the hidden leaf. There are enemies straight ahead, said Hinata, veins bulging around her by Akigan. Naruto. Let me down. I'll take care of this, he replied. You head on to the village. With a nod, Hinata leaped down from his arms, disappearing through the canopy into the forest. The enemies weren't far ahead and didn't bother trying to hide their presences. Soon, three unfamiliar ninja blocked Naruto's path. Two men, one woman. Sound nin, by the looks of their attire and hit I ate. We were told to be on the lookout for you, said one of the men, a tall, smirking ninja with spiky black hair. The second, a female with long hair, added, you'll have to get past us if you want to enter the village. Despite the chaos that must have been waiting for him ahead, Naruto felt oddly distant. Everything that could have gone wrong was going wrong, but he felt cold and unreachable. The two ninja advanced upon him, their confidence in their own abilities bolstered by their superior numbers. Naruto felt his eyes glazing over. Running wind chakra down his tanto, he dropped his body low to the ground and disappeared. When he reappeared behind them, the pair collapsed in two identical spurts of blood. Since the day he had first killed, Naruto had taken many lives without a second thought. He'd told himself it was because it was easier that way, that it was the only way to live as a ninja. But now, his head was filled with thoughts about what he had just done, and he knew. These two who he had just slain, they must have had missions of their own, team members they wanted to protect, ambitions they'd longed to achieve. He had taken all that away in a single instant, and the more he thought about it, the more Naruto realized that he felt absolutely nothing. He really only did care about himself. Everything he had ever done had been for himself. He had only wanted to be acknowledged by his village so that they would look at him. He had only wanted to protect his teammates so that he wouldn't be alone. They had all been right about him. The third member of the cell, a man with a bandaged face, looked stunned. He must have realized that there was nothing he could do, for he was frozen. His gaze inched up until they met Naruto's. And in a flash, the man fled. Maybe even just a few hours ago, Naruto would have finished the job. Now, however, he didn't bother to pursue him. Instead, he directed his gaze back to the village. An inhuman roar came from beyond its walls, and he knew that the tailed beast within the hidden sands Jinchuriki must have been released. How many villages had linked hands to launch this siege against a hidden leaf? An attack on this scale was unprecedented. Despite all their intel and preparations for an attack, how many casualties must there already be? Would there still be a village left standing after all this? Did it matter? We endure. Naruto had spent the last few years trying to figure out the meaning of these words, and somewhere along the way, he may have come to terms with it. But he realized now, it wasn't that he had nothing to endure for. It was that he had no reason to endure. There was a hole inside of Naruto. He had tried to fill himself up with his training, his missions, even the people he'd cared about. But no matter what he put in, he knew he would never be able to fill it up. His whole body had become ice cold. He raised a foot to step forward. And then, he lowered it back down. Why was he rushing to return to the village? What did the hidden leaf's fate mean to him? 
Another distant roar echoed from beyond the village gates. Black smoke filled the sky, a pyre's smoke preceding a burial. Slowly, the sound of his heartbeat slowing in his ears, Naruto began to turn away. And then, in that instant, he felt the familiar sensation of memories flooding his mind. The memories of the clone he had left behind in the village before he'd set out on his escort mission. The door to his apartment opened with a creak, revealing a masked ninja. Hmm? Naruto? Kakashi seemed surprised to see him. Why are you still here? Weren't you sent out on a mission? A pause. Oh, you're a clone, aren't you? You'd think you'd have learned by now, said Naruto's clone. What are you sneaking into my apartment for again? With a flourish, Kakashi pulled a book out from his breast pocket. I'm just here to return this. I'm done with the red. Has Jureya-sama told you when the next will be coming out? Why don't you ask the man yourself? Muttering something about not wanting to interrupt such a busy and important person, Kakashi thrust the book into Naruto's hands. Before he left, he asked, assuming Naruto doesn't come back in time, will you be coming to watch the third exam? Yes, I'll be in the audience. All right, I'll see you then. I've got a training session too. Kakashi's voice faded away, replaced by another memory that followed a well-trodden path past a training ground. The lone figure stood in front of the memorial stone, his face awash with the light from the setting sun. To the clone's surprise, it was Menma, dressed in civilian clothes. He held a white carnation in his hand, and kneeling, he carefully laid it to rest in front of the stone. So you're the one who's been leaving these, said Naruto's clone. Menma jumped at the sound of his voice, and his face coloring, he nodded. My aunt runs a flower shop, so it's no trouble for me. He paused. I heard about your promotion to Jonan. Congratulations. You deserve it. In a splash of color, Menma's uncharacteristically embarrassed face faded into black, and then Naruto found himself in a stadium full of chattering people. Ignoring the looks from the others in the audience, Naruto's clone seated himself on a bleacher. He would have been content to have been left alone, but soon, a large shadow fell over him. He looked up to see a tired-looking Jureya heave himself into the seat beside him. Where have you been? The clone asked. I've been keeping busy, Jureya grunted, clearly not in the mood to talk. What about you? You're a clone, right? Where's Naruto? On a mission. Jureya seemed surprised. I'd thought Saratobi-sensei was going to put that off until after the exams. Well, let's enjoy the show, shall we? His surroundings froze. And in a jarring shift, Jureya disappeared, and the stadium was in shambles. Screams. Chaos. It was pandemonium, and for a moment, Naruto's clone dumbly watched the tailed beast roaring into the sky. Was that how monstrous he had appeared when he lost control over the Nine Tails? Protect the lords! Shouted an Anbu commander. His agents, who had burst into action from their scattered posts, leaped to his bidding. In a flash, Kakashi appeared in front of him. Sakura, Menma. Get the civilians away from here. Sasuke and Naruto. With me. If we want to stop that tailed beast, our best bet is going to be to wake up that Jinchuriki. Sound Nin had appeared over the village walls and were now flooding into the arena. Nearby, an aim Nin was exchanging blows with a leaf Nin, and a Suna Nin charged towards Naruto's clone. Sidestepping the enemy ninja, Naruto's clone killed him with a slash of his tanto before returning his attention to the unfolding battles around him. The hidden villages of the sound, the rain, and the sand. They were all betraying the hidden leaf? What about the grass and rock villages? Kakashi-sensei. Started the clone. He stopped. A kunai gleamed in front of Kakashi's neck. The jonin's eyes widened in shock, there was a ninja behind him, wearing a swirling orange mask. Where had he come from? I'll be taking this back, said the masked ninja, pulling up Kakashi's hit I ate. And then in a single motion, he ripped the jonin's left eye out. Kakashi let out an anguished cry as blood streamed down the side of his face. Shoving the jonin away, the masked ninja turned towards Naruto's clone. Now. Is this the Jinchuriki, or is this one of those infamous shadow clones? He raised another kunai. Only one way to find out. The tailed beast roared, thrashing its tail and shattering another section of the stadium. Down on the shaking ground, his face contorted in pain, Kakashi gritted out, Naruto. Run. Naruto's clone raised his tanto to defend himself. But in the blink of an eye, the masked ninja disappeared, and before he could react, he could feel the cold certainty of steel bite into his neck. Naruto opened his eyes. For a moment, he didn't move. He stood stock still, breathing. Inhale. Exhale. You're empty, remember? He reminded himself. Lightning sparked. Blood was rushing to his head, his face felt hot. Naruto felt the earth below him crack as his heels dug into the ground. And then, he was moving. Faster than he had ever moved before, he raced towards the smoking village. 
The jumble of confused thoughts had all faded away. Naruto moved now at the bidding of a single thought, a single purpose. Kakashi Sensei. End of Chapter 37. Chapter 38. The Burning Leaf. Panting, a woman with long blonde hair raced through the dark tunnels below the hidden cloud village. The water running through the tunnels was murky and stank of sewage, it was not a place she would have liked to venture into, but her current circumstances had given her little choice in the matter. Her name was Nai Yagido, and she was one of the hidden clouds to Jinchuriki. Above ground, an explosion rocked the surface. Her face paling, Yagido nevertheless pressed onwards, eyes strained for the slightest movement in the dim light. And there. Ever so slightly, something had just moved. Stealing herself, she dropped to all fours. Show yourself. Plip. A droplet of water dripped from the ceiling to the wet floors. A gray-skinned man wielding a bandaged sword revealed himself, stepping out from the shadows. I must say, you are quite the slippery one, two tails. I was just about to flood the entirety of your village to find you. Eyes narrowing, Yagito took in his appearance. His face alone was distinctive, with markings like a shark, but the cloak was an immediate giveaway as to his identity. The Rikage had warned her that they would be coming for her eventually. She knew he was not an opponent to take lightly. You cannot defeat me. Her voice ended in a roar, bright blue flames erupting along Yogito's form in the shape of a feline beast. While it was a sight that would have shaken the heart of any ordinary man, he was anything but. Reaching up to grip the hilt of his sword, the man grinned, revealing a mouthful of sharp teeth. You aren't the first to tell me that. Nor, I suspect, will you be the last. Another distant explosion sounded. Dust fell from the ceiling. The man's sword began to quiver in excitement, and he gave it a quizzical look. Footsteps sounded in the dark, and a dark-skinned man wearing sunglasses emerged. You say some arrogant things, shark face, but I'll soon be putting you in your place. The man frowned. You must be the eight tails. I had hoped you would be kept busy while I took care of this matter. The yellow pupils of Yagido's beast form veered an alarm towards the newcomer. Killer B, what about the village in Rikage-sama? Brothers got it covered and told me to find you, we'll take this one down together, and get the other one too, yeah. After a moment's hesitation, Yogito smiled jaggedly. If we both survive this, I'll have to treat you to dinner. Naruto, POV One moment, Naruto was in the forest surrounding the village, the next, he was beyond its walls, racing between familiar rooftops. The battle that his clone had witnessed in the stadium had spilled out, extending towards the civilian sectors of the village. Bodies, both local and foreign, were scattered out on the streets, engaged in ongoing skirmishes. To them, it must have been a battle to the death. To Naruto, however, the entire world was moving in slow motion. While he must have used his lightning chakra to speed up his nervous system countless times, this time, something was different. Whereas Naruto had always focused his chakra inside his own body, the immense amount of chakra he'd just processed had spilled out of its container, surging into his surroundings. Now, it was as though the world had become an extension of himself. He could sense every single body within his visible perimeter and track every slightest movement. It was not unlike what he experienced in his imperfect sage mode, but instead of sensing natural energy, he was sensing the electrical impulses in every living thing. A giant sand-colored beast rose out from the stadium. The one tail. Naruto knew its Jinchuriki, Gara, had to be somewhere inside it, allowing the beast to run berserk. However, that was something he would have to deal with later. Though only a few seconds had passed since Naruto's clone had dispersed, anything could have happened. Kakashi-sensei. Ever since Naruto had graduated from the academy and joined his team, the Jonin had been his teacher and ally. Naruto's Kenjutsu, his lightning chakra. They were both things that Kakashi had taught him. Despite all this, or perhaps because of it, it seemed that somewhere along the way, he had come to think of Kakashi as someone who would always be around to eat ramen with him. Now, it was painfully apparent that that wasn't the case. Naruto had traveled the world in search of answers and come out of it empty-handed. But maybe, he thought, he'd been overthinking the whole thing. Maybe, it was something much simpler. Kakashi POV Dark blood poured out of a hole in Kakashi's face. The Jonin's face twisted in agony, and he staggered once, twice. Before dropping to the ground. Kakashi Sensei. Cried Sakura, leaping forward. Frozen, Sasuke's eyes fixed on the spot where the masked ninja had been standing. All he could think about was how he hadn't been able to follow his movements at all. All of his training until now. What'd been the point? He was as helpless as he had been on that night. 
so it was a clone, as I suspected, said the masked man's amused voice. Well, no matter. He'll be here soon enough. From beside Sasuke, Menma brought his hands together. Mind destruction technique. To Sasuke's surprise, the masked man stiffened, and he realized to his astonishment that his teammate's jutsu had worked. Menma turned to him, his expression irate. What are you doing, Sasuke? Get him, shit. Sasuke pushed himself to action, drawing a pair of kunai from his holster and shooting towards the masked ninja. But it was too late. Menma's face contorted. I can't. He's. He broke off as the masked man abruptly moved, freed from the effects of the jutsu. Without slowing, Sasuke twisted his body to match the masked man's trajectory and plunged his kunai towards him. They sunk into his chest. And then kept going, as though moving through empty air. That won't do, said the masked man. A shrill sound rang in the air behind Sasuke. His Sharingan activated, and in the same instant, he ducked just in time to see another kunai slice through the air. Only. It hadn't been meant for him. Sasuke's gaze veered to his teammate. Menma's eyes were widening, his lips parting. Sasuke opened his mouth to shout, but there was no point. It was too late. Clang. A brilliant shade of red flashed, a split instant later, something low crackled. Suddenly, there was someone standing there, his tanto drawn to counter the kunai. It was Naruto. His face was blank, as per usual. But Sasuke had never seen Naruto like this before. His form awash in a surge of lightning chakra, his eyes blazed with a foreign emotion, and Sasuke found himself flashing back to their conversation the previous week. What you found out there? Was it worth it, leaving behind everything? Can you stand up, sensei? Asked Naruto, in a deceivingly calm tone. I'm fine. It's just a scratch, Kakashi gritted out, grimacing as Sakura tore off part of her apron skirt and wrapped it around his face. The masked man drew back his kunai and flipped back, putting distance between himself and Naruto. It's good of you to join us, Naruto. I've been wanting to meet you for quite a long time. While it was impossible to tell what the masked man was thinking, if Sasuke had to venture a guess, he would have described him as gleeful. Naruto didn't respond. He disappeared. Somehow, he was moving at a speed faster than even his Sharingan could track. And when he reappeared, his tanto pierced the spot the masked man stood. But just like with Sasuke, the blade cut through with zero resistance, as though swinging through empty air. Was it again Jutsu? No. It wasn't a trick. Naruto's tanto had gone straight through the masked man because the man wasn't there. And yet, at the same time, he was. For the second time in about as many seconds, Sasuke was reminded of just how little he knew, and something deep in his chest seethed. You three helped the others stave off the tailed beast, said Naruto, seemingly unfazed. I'll handle this one. The situation was grim. The tailed beast was on the loose in the middle of the village, and numerous enemy ninja were engaged in battle with Leaf Nin. But still. I made it in time. Naruto's speed had not failed him. Kakashi was still alive, and Team Kakashi remained intact. Unfortunately, the glow of relief was short-lived, as Naruto took in the sight of the masked ninja in front of him. Though his face was covered by a swirling orange mask, his black and red robes could mean only one thing, Akatsuki. The Hakage had been right about their presence. They were the organization that had given them so much trouble in Wave Country a few years back. They were the ones who were hunting down Jinchuriki, and by extension, Naruto himself, and they had been the ones to kill his teammates. Now, they had almost killed Kakashi. The heat in his face dissipating, Naruto drew his tanto from its sheath. It was not out of anger or a desire for vengeance, the chaos of emotions had settled down, the storm subsiding somewhere along the way. The world had ceased to move around Naruto, and he drew his blade because he understood with stark clarity that if he wanted to save Kakashi, if he, himself, wanted to live. The shinobi before him needed to die. But. Something was strange about the man. Over the years, Naruto had encountered many powerful shinobi. He had traded blows with other members of the Akatsuki, who were all at minimum S rank missing Nin. He had studied under Kakashi of the Sharingan, stood in the shadow of the god of shinobi, and traveled the world with a Sanin, the Toad Sage. Naruto knew how it felt to stand in front of a ninja so overwhelmingly powerful, he could only hope to outrun them. Naruto felt none of that from the masked man in front of him. In fact, he felt very little, if anything, from him at all. He was a man with a presence so faint, if he hadn't been holding Kakashi's bloody eyeball in one hand, Naruto wouldn't have spared him a second glance. And yet, Naruto couldn't kill him. His lightning chakra surged through him as he swung his tanto at top speed, but no matter how often his blade appeared to pierce the man, Naruto could sense him constantly disappearing and appearing. 
while it must have been some type of powerful warping ninjutsu, Naruto had never seen anything like it. And as the masked man continued to evade his blade, Naruto could feel the adrenaline rush starting to wear off. The burn of chakra exhaustion was creeping up on his limbs, time was running out. A man a few words, I see, said the masked man, as Naruto's tanto drove straight through his head. But I only want to talk with you. So you got that eye from Kakashi-sensei by talking to him, did you? Sakura snapped from behind Naruto. It was curious how the masked man had yet to go on the offensive. Though Naruto's onslaught left little room for a counterattack, given the masked man's flippant tone, he did not seem like someone on the verge of being overpowered. He shouldn't have been able to, but it was starting to seem that if the man so wished, he could turn the tables on Naruto. And yet. He didn't. Finally, Naruto lowered his tanto. What do you want? The masked man landed nimbly on his feet. He speaks. Now, let me ask you. His voice cut off as the tailed beast let out a furious roar, stamping its clawed feet and sending tremors through the ground. Shouts rang out, and Naruto could sense multiple bodies diving out of the way. Kakashi rose to his feet, his face pale from blood loss. Naruto, I saw Gara put himself to sleep using ninjutsu right before that tailed beast appeared. We need to stop it before it destroys the rest of the village. But why is that any of your concern? The masked man spread out his arms. Does the fate of the hidden leaf have anything to do with you? Naruto's eyes narrowed. Why wouldn't it have anything to do with me? I know how the villages treat their jinchuriki, at every step of the way, the village has isolated you. Taken advantage of you. In a sense. You're a lot like me. Another explosion sounded in the distance, this time away from the beast. Except you're not a jinchuriki. Naruto would have been able to sense if he was. Inclining his head, the masked man replied, you're right, I'm not a jinchuriki. But I do know one thing. That hole inside of you. Nothing in this world will ever fill it. Naruto stopped. His breath slowed, and for an instant, he thought he could see ghostly figures falling from the sky. Who are you? The masked man looked up at the tailed beast and then back down at Naruto. Something glinted in the mask's lone hole. Someone who's going to change this world. Toby, POV. To Toby, it was almost disconcerting how closely the boy resembled the fourth Hakage. He had known for years that except for his coloring, which took after his mother, Naruto's father had strongly influenced him. Now that they were finally face to face, however, he could appreciate for himself the fourth Hakage's last legacy. Appearance-wise, they could have been Depelgingers, and though Naruto did not appear to have been formally taught Fuinjutsu in any appreciable form, he seemed to rely heavily on his speed for his offensive, a tactic that echoed the fourth Hakage's own battle strategy. Still, there were notable differences. The fourth Hakage had been beloved from his childhood, a rising star by his teenage years, and a hero by the time of his death. In Toby's own youth, the fourth had been a walking legend. There had always been a sense of purpose and self-assuredness to his movements, and during his short reign as Hakage, he had been every bit the leader the village had needed. Naruto, on the other hand, had none of that. He had grown up unloved, with no friends or family to call his allies. Just from a single glance, Toby could tell. His facial expressions, his stance. Everything about Naruto was guarded. It reminded Toby strongly of his old self, and it told him that all the painstaking steps he had taken until now to ensure Naruto arrived at this point had been worth it. All of a sudden, something in his periphery hissed. Toby felt a familiar distorted flickering in his consciousness. The attack on the hidden cloud has begun, a voice spoke telepathically. Naruto was still staring at him, the blank expression on his face shifting to one of slight unease. The words Toby had shared appeared to have struck some sort of chord within him, just as he'd expected. Unfortunately, though he would have liked to stay longer to talk more and see the invasion to the finish, his abilities were needed elsewhere. Toby extended his hand to the boy. Think about it. Naruto, POV. Think about it. Holding up a hand in an ironic farewell, the man's body began to gradually disappear, as though wiping himself from existence. Naruto leaped forward, reaching out for Kakashi's eye. And this time, his fingers brushed against something solid. When the man disappeared, staring at his empty hand, after a moment, Naruto balled it into a tight fist. Someone who's going to change this world? What did that mean? A hand clamped down on his shoulder. Kakashi looked at him, his brow creased. Don't let his words distract you, Naruto. Right now, what's important is that we stop Gara. After a pause, Naruto nodded. With Kakashi safe, the reality of the situation developing in the hidden leaf was starting to feel more tangible. 
And when Akatsuki was the group responsible, Naruto couldn't say that it had nothing to do with him. All the more so, with Kakashi asking for his help. The one tail let out another deafening roar, drawing Naruto's attention. Though it was too far out of his newfound range to sense, it would be a simple matter to retrieve Gara. Except his chakra exhaustion had finally caught up to him. Even standing up was scraping the bottom of his barrel. His senses were rapidly dulling, the world was starting to move around him, the way it had used to. But he was not quite out of options yet. The two shadow clones he'd summoned before returning to the village. They'd had all night under the moonlight to meditate. It was time to take advantage. Drawing back his shadow clone, which sat meditating in a clearing a long distance away, Naruto felt chakra flowing back into his body. At first, it was the chakra he had initially dispensed to create the clone. And then like a dam breaking, he felt natural energy begin to pour into his body. It was pure unadulterated energy. It did not distinguish between good or evil, it simply rewarded those with the patience to open themselves and accept everything it offered. The chakra filled him and molded him. Lightning crackled around Naruto before snapping into a low, controlled hum that shrouded him. Naruto felt his senses return, magnified to even greater heights than before. The balance of his own energy and natural energy was nearly perfect. The only thing still in his way was the Nine Tails' interference. But the slight hitch was still enough to throw it out of balance. Naruto felt the energy start to lap and influence his body. As his hair rapidly grew and his fingers and toes sharpened into claws, a quick sweep of the battlefield told Naruto everything he needed to know. Gara was buried in the sandy head of the One Tail. Jiraiya was fighting a bizarre and monstrous chakra signature that seemed to be operating from inside a puppet. The Hakage was trapped inside a barrier and engaged in battle with an equally monstrous chakra signature. Most of the other jonin were fighting off teams of enemy shinobi. Sasuke and his teammates were doing a surprisingly good job at keeping the one tail occupied while also fending off a squad of sand shinobi. Kakashi was on his way to join them, but when he was suddenly missing half his depth perception, Naruto doubted the jonin would be able to do much. Naruto took a tentative step forward and then began to move. The world moved in slow motion as he raced past Kakashi, past Sasuke's teammates. Running up the walls of the stadium, he leaped onto the one tail. Its yellow pupils grew bigger as he drew close, and then he was standing right above where he could sense the unconscious Gara. Just as the one tail's pupils began to flicker towards Naruto, he ran wind chakra down his tanto and plunged the blade into its sandy head. It let out a roar that blasted his ears and threatened to blow him off, but ignoring it, he wedged the blade back to reveal a head of red hair. It was Gara, slumbering in a ninjutsu-induced sleep, allowing the beast within to wreak havoc. It would have been simple enough to kill him. Naruto was confident a point-blank Rasengan combined with his speed would do the job. He thought his old self might have gone ahead and done it, heedless of questions, thinking only of what needed to be done. But now, Naruto found himself hesitating. Why? What was different from before, when he'd taken the lives of the Sound Nin with ease? And then it struck him, it was because Naruto had seen this scene before. He had seen it in himself back when he had been reeling from the deaths of his teammates and given himself over to the Nine Tails. At the time, Kakashi had called out to him and brought him out. Gara, on the other hand, seemed to have no one to call his name. He was surrounded by enemies. But why? What circumstances had brought Gara to this moment? What was the difference between them? Was it just that they had been born in different villages? If Naruto had been born the Jinchuriki of the One Tail, would that have been him, buried in the head of a sand monster? In a sense. You're a lot like me. Naruto looked down at the red-haired Jinchuriki below him and wondered if there weren't others like him in the world. Drawing back his fist, Naruto punched Gara. Hidden Cloud Village The water around her was endless. Yugito couldn't breathe. Her lungs were on fire, her head felt like it would explode. The Akatsuki intruder had fused with his sword to form a half-shark monster and used a technique to trap them underwater. To say the cat-like two tails sealed within her was not happy would be an understatement, and while Yugido and the two tails didn't get along on the best of days, they had never been as unified in intention as they were at that moment. We need to get out of here. As though privy to her thoughts, Killer B, surrounded by a shroud of his tailed beast chakra, swam past her. A short distance away, the monstrous shark-like intruder appeared to be hot on his heels. I'll distract him signaled Killer B. Get out. Perhaps thanks to his tailed beast being half octopus, Killer B appeared to be handling the lack of oxygen much better than Yogito. But still. To leave would be to abandon Killer B in the fight against the intruder, and that she could not forgive. Even if her lungs were about to collapse in on itself. 
There is a time and place for upholding one's honor, and now isn't it? Yowled the two tails. Her life was starting to flash before her eyes, though Yogito hated to admit it. The two tails was right. She wouldn't be much help to Killer B if she drowned here. As the intruder chased after Killer B, who swam in the opposite direction, Yogito could see the border of the water draw closer to her. With the last weak kick of her legs, she propelled herself forward and then, gasping, she broke out of the water prison. Landing hard on the stone floor, Yogito coughed and took in quick painful gulps of air. Drained as she was, her water lot and clothes weighed heavily upon her as she pushed herself up, but there was no time to waste. She needed to find reinforcements. Yogito had lost track of time in the fight against a shark intruder, but surely the Rikage and the Cloud Zanbu would have taken care of the other intruders by now. The ones causing the explosions above ground. Out of everyone, the Rikage would know what to do. And no matter how powerful the intruder, together with Killer B, the pair would be unstoppable. Several sections of the sewers had collapsed in on themselves, and it was with great relief that Yogito finally saw light peeking down through the exit path. Pushing herself to the limit, she sped up, bursting into the open. The sight that awaited her caused her heart to stop. It was not sunlight, but fire, that lit the path. Flickering flames at her feet led to a blazing inferno sweeping through the hidden cloud. The stone structures that had supported their village were now mere chunks of rock, crumbling before her very eyes. The air was thick with smog, and Yogito had to cover her nose and mouth as she made her way to the center of the village. As she drew closer, she caught sight of a giant white bird-like beast in the air. Each flap of its wings caused a ripple in the fire around it. And then there. She could make it out, the dark, hulking figure of the Rikage standing on a platform. But he wasn't alone. There were two figures by him, dressed in the Akatsuki cloaks of black and red. And yet, the Rikage wasn't attacking them. Instead, he was standing very still, while the two beside him conversed. Yogito, who'd been about to jump to the Rikage's side, hesitated. What was going on? Why wasn't he attacking them? Yogito, the voice calling her name came from a charred body lying on the ground that she'd assumed to be dead. The body lifted itself up, and Yogito found herself looking into a familiar face with shaggy white hair. Her stomach plummeted and Yogito dropped to her knees. Darui. She reached out for him, but he shook his head. Get out of here. What happened to the village? And Rikage-sama? They took us by surprise. And bombed the village. Then they got to the boss. Darui grimaced. Sorry. I couldn't protect. His voice trailed off. His eyes fluttered shut. Hidden Leaf Village Tamari wasn't exactly sure what had happened. She and Baki had been struggling to hold their position against a leaf shinobi and protect the monster when something red streaked by. A moment later, the monster let out the most awful, ear-splitting screech she had ever heard in her life. Then, the ground shook one last time. And the monster imploded. Chunks of matted sand began to fall down from the sky. Abandoning her giant fan, Tamari dove out of the way to avoid being buried alive. When she got back up, there was suddenly a ninja standing in their midst. He was a feral-looking leaf nin, and he was carrying Gara's limp body. Tamari's eyes widened in horror. Was her brother dead? Gara. Startled, the leaf nin turned to her. In his arms, Gara's body twitched, as though he'd somehow heard her voice, and Tamari felt relief sweep over her. However, it was quickly replaced with another sense of dread, as the leaf nin held a kunai up to Gara's neck. Call off your men, or I'll kill him. Hidden Cloud Village Lightning flashed in the dark cloud surrounding the hidden cloud, followed moments later by the sound of rumbling thunder. Droplets began to fall down from the sky, before turning into sheets of rain. The raging fire in the village had just started to dampen when a bedraggled figure emerged from the sewers, dragging a large body behind him. The body carved a trench in the scorched ground behind him, as the man made his way to the center of the village, where three others waited for him. Kasama, dropping his bloody load, took in the blank face of the hulking enemy figure standing in their midst. I see the plan was a success. Given what they say about the Rikage, I must admit I am surprised. The masked figure turned, and Kasama saw the blood red of the Sharingan gleam at him. The man had called himself Madara when they first met, and while Kasama wasn't sure whether he believed him, he knew that at the very least, his power to subjugate Kage under the control of his Sharingan was real. Unfortunately, the Genjutsu won't last much longer. He has one of the strongest wills I've ever encountered, said Madara. Well he just about had to crack when his entire village was getting blown up, yeah, crowed the man feared as the hidden rocks bomber, Didara. Raising an eyebrow, he then jabbed an accusing finger at the load on the ground. 
is that the Jinchuriki? Weren't we supposed to leave them alive? Oh, he is very much alive, Kasama answered. I simply cut off his legs so he wouldn't be able to get away. And what are the two tails? Asked Madara. Kasama didn't mince his words. I chose to prioritize the eight tails capture, and she escaped during the fight. Very well. Dadara, search for her from the skies. To think the day would come when I'd take orders from Toby. Dadara sighed. Lightning flashed. Thunder rumbled. As the Rikage silently stood guard behind them, a droplet of rain landed on his face, sliding down his cheek. Hidden Leaf Village Many years had passed since Anoki had set foot inside the Hidden Leaf's walls, and the first impression he got was that the bastards were doing entirely too well for themselves. The constant stream of visitors in and out of the Hidden Village, hidden in nothing but name, was indicative of a rapidly growing economy. It was a far cry from the Hidden Rock, which was a natural stronghold with its mountainous terrain. Under Anoki's leadership, the village maintained a strict military focus, visitors could only enter after rigorous screening, and their entire stay was monitored. The Hidden Leaf, on the other hand, seemed to be allowing in anyone who could rub two Ryo together. It was an utter disgrace, and Anoki had expected nothing less from the incumbent Hakage. Now, however, he had reason to suspect that the village was plotting to seize power. It was why Anoki had accepted the Leaf's offer to have his Genin take part in their exams so he could investigate for himself. Over the past few years, various Jinchuriki had been quietly disappearing. Anoki's intelligence network hadn't been able to pinpoint exactly which, but it was an undeniable truth. As for where the blame lay, call him senile, but Anoki was no fool, he knew the mercenary organization called Akatsuki was behind it. As a previous client of the group, however, he had not expected them to lay a hand on his village. But just recently, the Hidden Rock had lost their Five Tails Jinchuriki. Han had been sent on a top-secret mission with two other operatives whose remains were discovered days after they'd been expected to return. A double blow after the departure of the Four Tails Jinchuriki years before. If Akatsuki was so bold as to lay a hand on a Jinchuriki of his village, they must have a mighty ally and contractor. It had to be either the Rikage or the Hakage, and between the two of them, Anoki suspected the latter. However, it seemed that Anoki had been wrong. Great walls of purple fire roared around the distant figures of the Hakage and the Kazakage's impersonator. Shinobi affiliated with sand, rain, and sound were pouring into the village, and skirmishes were breaking out between them and the leaf nin. Lord Third, said Katsuchi, his son and right-hand man. Our genin have been safely evacuated. It seems our suspicions about the leaf were misplaced, said Anoki gravely, watching a group of aim nin overwhelm a young leaf chunin. Katsuchi nodded. What shall be our next course of action? The hidden leaf was on fire. And in a time when their closest allies had all betrayed them, surely, they would appreciate some help. But it would not come from the hidden rock. It was none of their business, especially when they had never formally established an alliance. Anoki's primary concern was to return to his village and reinforce their defenses. This is not our battle. We will be withdrawing. Yes, sir. Anoki felt the weight of gravity lift from his shoulders, and then he was floating up into the air. As he rose higher and higher, until he was above its walls, the screams of battle grew more and more distant. A war was brewing. Anoki could smell the fumes of death approaching. And unlike the leaf, the hidden rock would be ready. End of chapter 38 Chapter 39 Blind Animal Raindrops poured down from the dark sky, overflowing the beaten banks of the hundreds of rivers that winded through rain country. Its largest river fed into a lake that surrounded the hidden rain, a city full of swaying metal towers with inhabitants that stole whispered conversations under bamboo umbrellas. Farther out, away from the city, a simpler people rested under thatch troughs, the grass muting the deafening roar of the constant rainfall. Beyond the last hut, the land plunged sharply in a cliff, and thick clouds swept over the edge, filling the flutelands below. It was there, beyond the towers, the huts, and the flutelands, that an immense cave rose out of seemingly nowhere. It lay in a fog so dense, only those who had lost their way could possibly stumble upon the cave. For several years now, the cave had been the hiding place of a gigantic wooden statue. The wood was rough and hewed and shaped in a humanoid form. Holding secrets long since forgotten over a millennia, it had nine eyes, three of which stared unblinkingly out at the other occupants of the cave. A missing nin bearing the slashed hitai aid of the hidden waterfall made his way to the center of the cave. On his shoulder, he carried the unconscious body of a large man in armor, throwing it heavily down on the ground, he surveyed his surroundings with a keen gaze. Don't tell me I'm the first one back? 
even after the long chase this one gave me? Kasama is currently on his way back with the eight tails Jinchuriki, answered a woman's voice. Sitting alone and closest to the cave's entrance sat a young man with white hair. Bearing his jagged teeth in a grin, he added, seems like the two tails managed to get away, though. A mere setback. It is only a matter of time until we capture the rest, said a deep voice from farther back in the cave. Of his dark silhouette, only a pair of penetrating, ringed eyes could be seen. And now, with the addition of the five tails, we are another step closer to our goal. I see several new faces. Am I right to assume these are the new replacements? I've heard a lot about you, said the young man. The immortal bounty hunter, Kakuzu. A source told me that you handed in the bounty of Raiga, one of the seven swordsmen. You wouldn't happen to know the whereabouts of his sword, Kiba? Kakuzu's pupil less eyes traveled to meet the young man's. Doesn't seem to ring a bell. I'm sure it doesn't. As the two regarded each other warily, shadows shifted in the recesses of the cave. Slowly, a figure separated from the darkness to reveal a slashed hidden rain hit I-8 and an expressionless face bearing multiple metal piercings. Let us begin the extraction process. Karen POV No, said Karen, relishing the taste of the word in her mouth. It was a sight she'd always longed to see. Her teammate staggered before her, a jumble of sagging flesh and intestines. It was a horrible death, and Karen only wished it had been more drawn out. However, judging from all the blood he had lost, he should have already been dead. But as though carried by a wrathful spirit, Burami stumbled to his feet, face twisted in agony and hatred, and breathed at her, No, you. Useless bitch. I'm going. To bite every inch of you. Until you're screaming. Squirming. I'm going to kill you. His words were empty, and yet, Karen felt the smile fade from her face. You're already too far gone. You can't kill me. Burami spat out a glob of blood, and Karen flinched as specks splattered across her face. When Zasui finds out what you've done. At the mention of the name, Karen involuntarily took a step back, and Burami grinned bloodily. He. He'll suck you dry. Just like your mom. And you'll wish you were. Dead. You. Watch. His eyes rolling back, he dropped to the ground. The sour stench of urine filled the air. Finally, her teammate was dead. But instead of feeling satisfaction, Karen found her eyes drawn to Burami's face. His lips were still reared back, frozen in a sick grin. She felt her stomach twist. And then she heaved, hot bile souring her throat. Naruto, POV Naruto held the blade of his kunai to Gara's neck. Call off your men, or I'll kill him. The grains of sand that protected Gara shivered in place, and Naruto felt the eyes of both sand and leaf nin fixate upon him. It was a bluff, of course. There were too many questions he wanted to ask and too many things he wanted to know about Gara. Judging from the way the faces of the Sand Nin blanched, however, it seemed they could grasp the ramifications of his threat. We don't have the authority to do that, said a Sand Jonin. We follow only the command of the Kazakage. Time was running out. Naruto was already on his second clone, and he could feel the last droplets of natural energy seeping out of his limbs. One final push of his senses, and he searched the battlefield for a chakra signature that could have belonged to the Kazakage except, there was none. Either your Kazakage isn't here, or he's already dead, he said. That's right, Kakashi spoke up, he and his Chunin team had been the primary engagers in the fight against the Sand Nin. Someone was impersonating the Kazakage. I suspect it was the deed of the missing Nin known as Arachimaru. The Jonin's face hardened. Impossible. Your lies won't shake us. Our allies have barricaded your Hakage with the Kazakage, and it is our lord who will emerge victor. No. Another Sand Nin began hesitantly. They're not lying. I haven't been able to sense the Kazakage since we arrived at the village. The Sand Kanoichi, Tamari, recoiled. What? That's impossible. I saw Fath. The Kazakage sitting with the other Kage during the exam. Arachimaru is infamous for his use of a technique that can steal faces, said Kakashi. That may have been the case with the Kazakage. The Sand Jonin furiously turned on his subordinate, who shrank back. Why didn't you say anything until now? The Kazakage's escort informed me it was part of the plan. Since when? The growing looks of confusion on the Sand Nin's faces told Naruto everything he'd needed to know about their involvement in the invasion on the Hidden Leaf. Or perhaps, more accurately, their lack of involvement. It seemed they'd all been played like puppets in a much larger scheme that had taken advantage of the Hidden Sand's struggling circumstances. Lower your weapons, said Naruto. Or the Jinchuriki dies. The Sand Nin collectively turned towards the Jonin, whose face twisted in a myriad of emotions. Anger. Confusion. Doubt. Weariness. 
Tamari stepped forward, her jaw set. Baki. The Jonin dropped his blade to the ground with a clatter. Following suit, the rest of the Sand Nin lowered their weapons. At the same time, Naruto felt his limbs returning to their original state, and as his strength left him, he lowered his Tanto blade from Gara. Hinata POV The situation was worse than anything Hinata could have imagined. Metal screeched as weapon met weapon. Red painted faces groaned on the ground. Black smoke marred a cloudless sky. Medic, shouted a voice, snapping back to attention. Focus, Hinata. She hurried to the source, a female Anbu wearing a cat mask. She held an unconscious male Chunin in her arms, who appeared to be bleeding out. Though Hinata couldn't see the Anbu's face, from the tone of her voice, she must have been frantic. I tried stabilizing him, but he's getting worse. As soon as she saw his injury, Hinata felt the panic disappear, leaving behind a sharp, focused calm. Lay him flat on the ground, she commanded. And if any enemy ninja approach, protect us. With a swallow, the Anbu nodded. Hinata activated her Byakugan, and the injured man's body revealed itself to her. A deep gash stretched across his abdomen, a wound that, while serious if left untreated, was not immediately life-threatening. The man's body suddenly spasmed, before stiffening, and a bubble of frothy sputum formed at his lips. Hinata frowned, focusing her survey. Judging from the symptoms, there had to be something else. There. It was faint, but obvious now that she knew what she was looking for. Some kind of foreign agent was in his blood, shutting down his system. The moment it reached his heart, the man would go into cardiac arrest. All of a sudden, the female Anbu flung out a shuriken that embedded itself into the forehead of a ninja from the hidden rain, who dropped to the ground. In the same breath, she formed a tiger hand seal before blowing out a fireball at another rain assailant. Meanwhile, Hinata concentrated her chakra into her fingertips and pressed them around the areas she could see the foreign agent, blocking any further progression. Then, her hands glowing with the feigned aura of medical ninjutsu, she guided the worst of it out of his system. Black liquid pooled out of his facial orifices, and the effect was immediate, as the man shuddered once, before relaxing. His eyes fluttered and then opened. Hey eight! cried the Anbu, jumping to his side. Suddenly, Hinata heard a moan. Fifty feet away, the foreign ninja that the Anbu had defeated lay on the ground, their body scorched and still sizzling. The awful smell of singed meat filled the air. Half their face had melted away, but they were still alive. A sunken eyeball in a lidless socket turned towards Hinata. Her chest ached. Quickly joining their side, Hinata sheathed her hands in chakra. Placing them over the ninja's chest, she stopped their heart, and with one last sigh, the ninja fell silent. A bead of sweat trickled down her temple. Wiping it away, Hinata straightened up and surveyed the battlefield. Spotting another leaf nin splayed across the ground, she hurried towards them. There was much left for her to do. And while she couldn't get to everyone in time, she would do her best. Karen POV Too much. It was all too much for Karen. Too many people were dying. One by one, chakra signatures all around her were being rapidly extinguished, like candle flames in a maelstrom. While on an unprecedented scale, it was not an unfamiliar sensation for Karen, who curled up into a tighter ball inside her dark hiding place. In a flash, she found herself transported back to her hut in grass country, dark night peeking through the cracks in her ceiling. She could hear an odd clattering sound, and for a moment, Karen wondered if Zasui had found her. She tensed, waiting for his iron grip to clench around her arm when she realized she was alone, and the sound was coming from her chattering teeth. No more, she thought. Something heavy crashed outside onto the wall of the shed, and she wondered if it was Burami, still howling for her. Perhaps his blood, still splattered across her face, had summoned him? No, she thought, squeezing her eyes shut. But despite her words, she could still feel hands grabbing her, pawing at her. Phantom teeth chomped on her arms, and she felt the drain of chakra leaving her. Clink, clink, clink. While Karen knew none of it was there, she could almost feel it. The cold metal of chains encircling her ankles and binding her. They bit into her skin, leaving them raw and stinging painfully. They held her there, and she wondered if that was all her life had ever amounted to. Maybe, she thought, she just wasn't strong enough. Just like her mother hadn't been. Tears pooled up at the corners of Karen's eyes and slid down her cheeks, before landing on her shoulder. It was then, in that instant of utter darkness, that she sensed him. Though his chakra had disappeared for a while now, all of a sudden, she could sense it again. Quiet, yet resilient, reserved, yet beautiful. In a village filled with chakra signatures as numerous as the stars, his alone glowed with the light of a setting sun. Karen clambered up to her feet, her head clearing. That was right. 
she was no longer a child, trembling in her hut. She was a Kanoichi in a shed at the periphery of the Hidden Leaf Village. She took a tentative step forward and felt the jerk of chains pulling her back. No, Karen thought again. Eyes still shut, she reached out with her mind's eye, and again, she could feel his chakra signature. The paradoxical cold and warmth of it calmed her pounding heart. You're welcome. In the dark, Karen reached out with her hands and pushed the doors of the shed open. Stepping forward, the warmth of sunlight fell across her face, and the screams of battle that she'd muted returned at full volume. With the one tail no longer terrorizing the area around the stadium, the leaf appeared to have gained the upper hand. Though the unmoving bodies on the ground were in equal parts leaf nin as they were foreign ninja, the number of active skirmishes had dropped. Naruto knew several large-scale battles were still ongoing. The last time he'd checked, both the Hakage and Jiraiya had been fighting against two formidable foes. However, with his own chakra reserves on its last legs, the only thing he could do was to have faith in their abilities. Given the circumstances, their primary concern was to keep an eye on Gara. In the meantime, Sasuke and Sakura had left to help rescue more civilians, and Naruto and the remaining members of Team Kakashi tied up the captured Sand Nin. This is chakra rope, explained Menma, crouching down to bind the Jonin's wrists. Picked it up from my uncle. It blocks chakra flow so that they can't escape. As Menma finished the rest, Kakashi turned to Naruto. The left side of his face was covered, as it usually had been, it felt strange knowing that under the bandages, the infamous Sharingan eye was no longer there. He had to wonder how its absence would affect the Jonin's future. That masked man. Started Kakashi. He was there, in Wave Country. He was the one who killed Zabuza. Naruto raised his eyebrows, he had never read the official mission report, and had always assumed Kakashi had been the one to kill the missing Nin. What did he mean by taking back the eye, Sensei? I can't say that I know. I'm still thinking about it myself. Are there any Achiha, other than Sasuke, that are left? There is the one who massacred the clan in the first place. But I knew him, personally, and his fighting style was nothing like the masked man. Kakashi paused. As for what he said to you, I know that I have become busy with my team lately, and you have your own duties now. But Naruto, I hope you know that I consider you. Well, very highly. While Kakashi seemed to have lost his usual eloquence, Naruto thought he understood. The answers he had been seeking in the outside world. Maybe they'd been here this entire time. Somewhere inside of him, something was starting to take shape. While mostly intangible, with a little more effort, he thought he might be able to make something of it. Naruto wondered whether the ramen stall was still intact. I don't know, sensei. What? After that sad showing you made in our match the other week, I don't know if I can take that as a compliment. Kakashi blinked. The corners of his lips twitched upwards. I guess we'll need to have another rematch soon. I'll make you eat those words. Making a non-committal sound, Naruto replied, we'll see. You were never this cheeky to me before. Kakashi sighed. All this, just because we're the same rank now? I never took you for that kind of person. You can blame Jiraiya sensei for that. Kakashi opened his mouth to reply, when suddenly, Menma let out a shout, shit, he's waking up. Immediately, Naruto jumped up. It was impossible. The blow he had delivered should have knocked him out for at least an hour. But he realized in a rush that he'd miscalculated. That while a normal person may have been out for an hour, the same rules didn't apply to a Jinchuriki. Mother is angry. That was the first thing Gara knew when he regained consciousness. Or perhaps, it was what had awoken him. Just as I was freed, you dare to imprison me? His head was groggy. What had happened? Was the village destroyed? Why couldn't he move? Gara felt his eyes widen as he realized. He was tied up. Trussed up with rope and thrown aside, his face pressed into the dirt. As though he was just anybody. You dare? Voices were shouting all around him. Chest heaving, Gara strained against his bindings. They were strong, but it was nothing for him, breaking free, he felt his chakra begin to recirculate through his body, and he got to his feet. He felt his body sway, his head was spinning. Everything was black and red. There were no faces, only others. Others who hated him, dreaded him, feared him. His vision was rapidly turning completely red as mother's chakra oozed out, covering him. Sheltering him. As always, mother was the only one who understood. Gara started to laugh, the sound ringing out harshly from his chest. He wouldn't just give himself up to mother, as he had when he fell asleep. No. He would become mother. Gara. A voice called out his name. Stop. A concerned face with sandy hair appeared before him. Gara felt his eyes widen. He knew that face. It couldn't be him. The Ashimaru? His uncle. How was he here? Had he somehow returned from the dead? 
was he here to complete his mission of assassinating Gara? With a roar, he slashed the air, hearing a satisfying thud. And then silence. It had all happened in the blink of an eye. One moment, Naruto had been talking with Kakashi just outside the stadium. The next, Gara was awake, and there was a body on the ground. It was the sand genin named Tamari. It may have been a fatal blow, for she didn't stir from where she'd landed. Naruto stared at her broken body. While he'd never exchanged words with her, he had noticed her from afar. Ninpo? Shinranshin no Ju. Menma's voice cut off as Gara let out another roar and swiped the air. A whip of sand lashed out at his bidding. Menma. Kakashi shouted. His gaze followed Menma, who just barely managed to dodge the attack. Before jerking towards Naruto. Do you think you can move? Naruto grimaced. His entire body felt like a wooden block. Don't worry about me. I can still protect myself. Despite his words, there wasn't much he could do anymore, frustrating as it was. Maybe if it had been nighttime, with the moon out, he might have been able to dredge up another shadow clone to summon natural energy. But the way he was now, he didn't think he could even summon a normal clone. Please. Untie us, shouted the sand jonin, his face stricken. Tamari. After a pause, Kakashi quickly strode over and cut through the jonin's bindings with a kunai. If you turn on us, there will be no more mercy, he said in an icy tone. Rubbing his bruised wrists, the sand jonin nodded before rushing to Tamari's side. Will you be okay, sensei? Naruto asked. Kakashi turned back to him, his eyebrows raised. I may not have the Sharingan anymore, but I do still have a thousand jutsu under my belt, you know. You watch yourself, Naruto. In a flash, he was gone. The emergency painkiller Kakashi had taken was kicking in. The agony in the left of his skull had ebbed away to a dull, manageable pain, and the fog in his head was clearing. Oddly enough, aside from the blatantly missing eye, Kakashi felt. Good. While some of it may have been from the adrenaline rushing through him, he had always suspected the ever-active Sharingan to be draining his chakra, not unlike a leech. With a tripped away, Kakashi could feel surges of chakra bellowing up from within. Unlike before, Gara's body had started to undergo transformation. Half his face had distorted into a sand-colored beast with pitch-black eyes, and the same side of his body had grown a large claw and the beginnings of a tail. It was clear he was an uncontrolled Jinchuriki. Kakashi didn't know whether it was out of any fault of the host or an indication of a faulty seal. Whichever it was, he felt a surge of pity for the boy. The confusion, the hatred. He couldn't help but see something of Naruto inside Gara, And maybe a little of himself as well. One tail. He said. It's time you went back inside. Feral eyes veered and Gara sprung towards him. Concentrating a churning ball of chakra into his hand, Kakashi dodged the blow. While his aim would inevitably be off, he'd been making mental adjustments with every movement he took, and without hesitation, Kakashi slammed the Rasengan into Gara's back. It was a direct hit, albeit on a shield of sand that automatically rose up to meet his fist. Making an explosive dust storm upon impact, a half-scream, half-roar sounded. Landing on his feet, Kakashi silently marveled at how little the Rasengan had drained his chakra reserves. Unfortunately, as expected, the attack seemed to have enraged the Jinchuriki more than injured him, as a gigantic claw suddenly jumped out and swiped at Kakashi. Quickly summoning a shadow clone, Kakashi swapped places with it, leaving it to distract Gara, while he observed from the shadow of a shattered building. Kakashi could batter at it however long he needed, it would be tough to get through the sand defenses of the infuriated Jinchuriki. At least, not without an unacceptable level of collateral damage to the village. Sensei, said Menma, appearing beside him. Should I try using my mind transfer jutsu on him? No, Kakashi replied immediately. His mind's too unstable right now. Then what should I do? Before Kakashi could answer, he heard a high-pitched shout in the distance. Naruto. Karen POV. Bodies lined the streets and fire swept across the rooftops, but none of that mattered to Karen. Her chest heaving, the sound of her heart pounded explosively in her ears. Her mouth was dry, her throat sour with bile. Please, make it on time. Karen didn't know what had happened, but in the space of mere minutes, somehow, his chakra signature had grown weak. Weaker than she'd ever seen it before. The elation that had been carrying her turned into terror, and it made her feel sick to the stomach. It was a terrible and strange feeling. Terrible, because Karen couldn't bear to even think about what would happen if that particular chakra signature were to be extinguished. And strange, because Karen knew that her feelings were one-sided. Karen wasn't stupid. She knew that to him, she was just a nobody from a foreign village. But it didn't matter, because to her, he was special. 
When she had been starving, he had given her fish to eat. It warmed her belly for a single night, and it was the best thing she had eaten in a long, long time. He barely seemed to remember, but that didn't matter. Karen remembered. There. In the distance, she saw him. A dot that grew bigger and bigger, to reveal a red-headed male in leaf fatigues. His chakra signature, while weak, was still hanging on. There was a monstrous signature nearby, the same one that had erupted in the stadium and started this whole mess, but that didn't matter. What was important was that he was there, breathing. Naruto, she shouted, eagerly. However, the wind carried her voice away from him, and she felt the monster instead turn its attention towards her. Its face twisted, and it leaped towards her. With a screech, the world seemed to slow down around her. Eyes widening, she followed the monster's trajectory through the air. The moment it reached her, she knew she would die. Clink. She would die, without having ever escaped her village. Clink. Clink. Without having killed Zasui. Clink clink clink. Without ever seeing the stars again. Clink clink clink. Without ever meeting Naruto again. No. Something within her. Everything that had been coiled up tightly inside for a long time. Exploded. In a burst of color, the world returned to its normal speed. Chains, glowing brightly with chakra, flew out of Karen, wrapping themselves around the beast. Kakashi could hardly believe his eyes. A red-haired woman, with chains coming out of her body that trapped themselves around a tailed beast. Kashina? No, it couldn't be. She'd died years ago, on the same night that had claimed the fourth Hakage. The woman before him must have been another survivor of the Uzumaki clan. And now that he looked closer, it was true. This particular woman wore glasses, and behind them were a pair of striking crimson eyes. Kakashi vaguely recalled seeing her before. She was a Kusa Genin participating in the Chunin exams. At the time, he'd even teased Naruto about her. He'd never expected to see that technique again, and it couldn't have come at a more opportune time. However, it looked as though she didn't know how to properly utilize the chains. Instead of completely subjugating Gara, the chains were merely pinning the Jinchuriki down on the ground. Like a feral animal that had been caught in a trap, Gara struggled for freedom, roaring in anger. He was more beast than human at this point. He was out of control, and he was destroying their village. It was unfortunate, but it left Kakashi with only one viable option. He drew in a deep breath and made up his mind. Palming a kunai from his holster, he began to channel lightning chakra into it. The ear-splitting sound of chirping birds filled the air. Without his Sharingan, he couldn't use the lightning cutter the way he'd used to. But on an immobilized opponent, this would be more than enough. Only. He couldn't guarantee Gara's survival. Wait! Shouted the San Jonan, standing up to block Kakashi's path. He held the dead girl's limp body in his arms, Kakashi could barely hear his voice over the sound of his jutsu, and had to read his lips to catch his words. You can't kill him. Kakashi resolutely shook his head. With a screaming sound, the kunai shone a bright blue. It was ready to go. Let me talk to him, begged the jonin. Just give me a few seconds. Without waiting for Kakashi's response, the jonin raced over to stand in front of the struggling jinchuriki. What is this? Unlike the ropes from before, Gara couldn't free himself. The things weighing him down looked like chains, but they must have been imbued with an unbelievable amount of chakra, for he couldn't even budge. With a gnash of his teeth, Gara screamed in frustration. His head was spinning. The world was red, and the others around him were jeering. He couldn't take it anymore. Gara. Again. Why did they keep calling out his name? This time, it was a man with red markings on his face. Baki. He may have been Gara's team leader, but in the end he, too, was another. Gara didn't need him. He raised his and mother's arm to bat him aside, when suddenly, Baki lifted up a body in his arms. Look at what you've done, Gara. For some reason, tears were streaming down the Jonin's face. You've killed Tamari. Your own sister. Tamari. What was Baki talking about? That wasn't Tamari. That was Yashimaru, his first would-be assassin. Tamari was back home with Kankuro. She was. The body. Its hair was tied up in pigtails. And her frame. It was a woman's body. Gara froze. Tamari. Suddenly, through the red haze, he remembered. His sister had accompanied him to the Chunin exams. They'd had ramen together just a few nights ago. And she'd been the one to signal to him during his match in the third exam. I. Killed her? Impossible as it seemed, Gara stopped struggling. The one tail's characteristics began to fade from the Jinchuriki, as the oversized arm and tail began to shrink, the chakra chains tightened and sink. Soon, only Gara in his fully human form was left. It seemed Kakashi had been wrong. There had been another option. He just hadn't been able to see it. 
he was glad to be proven wrong. Slowly, Kakashi lowered his kunai, and the shrill sound of birds faded away into the air. Kakashi of the Sharingan said a cold voice to his left. This is for Zabuza. Before he could react, something pierced through his back, ramming straight into his heart. His eyes widened. He looked down to see a bloody senban needle protruding from his chest. Suddenly, he couldn't speak. With the last of his rapidly fading strength, he looked back and saw a mask. A hunter nin? Kakashi stumbled before dropping to his knees. Someone was shouting, but he couldn't make out the words. Everything was growing dark. His chest was unbearably tight. He couldn't breathe. Was he dying? It was true what they said about your last moments. Kakashi could see his life flashing before his eyes. The faces of his loved ones surrounded him. His father, the once renowned White Fang of the Leaf. Abito, Rin, Minato Sensei, Mayu, Rai, everyone he'd ever held dear. They'd all gone before him, leaving him behind. It had been hard. But he was a shinobi, and he had endured alone as best as he could. No. That's not quite right. He hadn't been quite alone. He still had. Nah. End of chapter 39.